Hello, everybody out there in online land. This is yours truly, actor-entertainer Vic Martino. Actor-entertainer extraordinaire, as someone once labeled me, and whom I'd argue with that. But I'm here to present to you this uh, documentary film I made back in 2014. So over a decade ago, because it's now 2024. Oh my, how time flies. And it was entered in the uh, 2017 Williamsburg Film Festival to a, a really great reception, really good response from the, the audience. And it's been a while. I mean, it's, it's posted here on YouTube, but I just thought I would do this intro and reintroduce it to those of you who have seen it or haven't seen it. So if you have watched my documentary already, you've seen it in the past, I hope you enjoy it again. And if you haven't, I hope you enjoy it for the first time. So let's sit back, relax, and all watch it together while I have my chicken parmesan sandwich. Williamsburg, Brooklyn, then and now. Oh, pardon me. The full title is Williamsburg, Brooklyn, then and now, my mother and her friends, because it's about my mother Rose and some of her friends. And you'll find out who those are as you watch the documentary. Williamsburg, Brooklyn, 2015. It's trendy and it's the place to be. Homeowners can't rent apartments fast enough to the now transient residents that occupy the area. But Williamsburg, Brooklyn wasn't always like this. At least not the Williamsburg, Brooklyn of this story, circa the 1970s. It was a very different place. It was a place you didn't walk down the streets after dark, and if you did, you had better have had some sort of weapon on you. It was the place I spent my childhood, I being Vittorio Guillermo Pachichi, Vito William Pachichi. <laughs> There's a mouthful. Later to be known as Vic Martino. I grew up living at 149 Angel Lee Street in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Uh, that's where I spent most of my childhood. But my growing years were spent on 85 Hevemeyer Street. But this isn't so much a story about me as it is about some neighborhood people of the time. One of those neighborhood people was my mother, Rosie Bellucci, AKA Rosie Bull. She was the kind of person who would help anyone, and most people that needed help came to see her. Uh, if you were having trouble with a landlord or any kind of personal problem, people went to see Rose, and Rose went to see some of her friends. And I'll get to them momentarily. My mother had an older brother, Joseph Bellucci, a.k.a. Joe Bull. He was a good man with a good heart, but he was a tough bastard. Everyone respected Joe Bull, and that included, I guess, what one would call the neighborhood wise guys. One of my most vivid memories of my mother's brother was when I was looking out our uh, top floor apartment window, and my mother was yelling at me about something, and I sort of got a little disrespectful towards her. Well, the next thing I know, I'm hanging out the window by my ankles, courtesy of Joe Bull. Needless to say, I never mouthed it off to my mother again when he was around. Unfortunately, he died of a heart attack when I was still very young. I'll never forget how my mother was overcome with grief over losing her older brother, Joseph. She also had a brother, Johnny, and a brother, Carmine, who they called Maxie. She also had an older sister, Jean, my Aunt Jean, 
who was happily married for years to Charles DeMarco, my Uncle Charlie. Her younger sister was Anna, my Aunt Anna. She was the light and love of my life. She also passed on early when I was in my late teens due to a weak heart. You see, in those days, there were no pacemakers or defibrillators. Anyway, my mother, Rosie Bellucci, a.k.a. Rosie Bull, courtesy of her brother, Joe Bull, was married to a man named Emilio Martino. And they gave birth to my older brother, Michael, Michael Martino. Now, I don't know much about Emilio, as they never really spoke about him. All I know is he did some time in jail for being a bigamist. You see, while he was married to my mother, he was also married to someone else at the same time. My mother then met and married the man who was to be my father, John Pachichi. They called him Jake, although his birth certificate states his name was Jack. It was a turbulent marriage because my father was a heavy gambler and a womanizer. By the time I was six years old, they separated. One of my earliest memories of my father was when he would come to take me out for the day via the neighborhood Lama Street subway station. He would never come all the way up the subway station steps. He would have me come down the steps to meet him. See, he didn't want anyone to see him in the neighborhood because of his gambling debts that he owed to what were called Shylocks. If it wasn't for my mother, my father might not have been around any longer. You see, my mother had some very influential friends. Now, you might be wondering who they were. Well, some people might call them gangsters, some people might call them mobsters, but to me, they were just my mother's friends. One of those friends was James Napoli, Jimmy Knapp. He was a capo, a boss, in the Vito Genovese family. Some might say crime family, I'll just say family. My mother and Jimmy go way back. She knew him a long time and worked for him for many years. As a matter of fact, if my mother wasn't a woman, she would have probably been a made man. I have this one vivid memory when I was younger of my mother telling me to stay out of her room and never to go into her closet and never to look in any one of those shoe boxes that were up there on the shelf. Well, of course, the next thing, you know, when she wasn't home, I go right into her room and I look into her closet and I look into the shoe boxes. And what do I see? Guns, all sizes and shapes, guns. And I remember thinking, man, my mom is cool. Another memory I have is one day we were just, uh, you know, watching television or having dinner and all of a sudden there's a knock on the door and the cops come bursting in to take my mother away. Well, I went and grabbed the baseball bat and went to uh, clobber one of the cops, but my mother's, you know, the cop, of course, was like, hey, was, and my mother's like, no, 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 that's just my son, don't worry about it, but they were a little worried because I had a baseball bat in my hand to protect my mother. My mother wound up doing some time in Rikers Island. You know, a weekender. And from there on in, Rosie Bull became known as Rikers Island Rose. When we moved from 149 Angel Lee Street to 85 Heavenmeyer Street, both located in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, circa mid to late 70s, Jimmy Knapp owned the building we moved in. We lived on the top floor, and underneath us was the Highway Lounge. Now, that was the place where all the neighborhood guys, a.k.a. wise guys, hung out. That was the meeting place. That was the place. The Highway Lounge was the place where Jimmy Knapp and his crew did their daily business. Now, his crew was, you know, they had these nicknames. They didn't like to really use real names. And they had names like, you know, the obvious, like Lefty. And then there was Chopper. No, it's not what you think. He ran a chop shop. And there was Ski Ball and Hawaiian Eye. One of my favorites was Mixed Up Junior. He was a mathematical genius. 
he was really good at counting money. But the only thing is you had to be really very quiet because if you made any kind of noise, he would yell out, hey, you're getting me all mixed up. And that's how he became Mixed Up Junior. Then there was Sally Vigorigo. He used to sit right in front of the window of the highway lounge and sort of like a lookout and check everyone out that was in the neighborhood. And if he saw somebody that didn't live there or didn't belong there, he was like, hey, who's that guy? Who's that guy? Who's that fucking guy? What's he doing here? Where's he from? And then there was Sally's brother, Freddie Vigorigo. Freddie managed a very popular rock group at the time. Cool in the gang. Well, there was a point in time where Cool and the Gang decided they wanted to get new management. It wasn't a good idea. They approached Freddie with that thought, and Freddie's response was to, uh, well, to take the leader Cool aside and point a gun in his head and say, how would you like I shoot your fucking afro right off your fucking head? Afros were in style then, and, and you see these guys, they had a particular way of dealing with problems. Now, back to the Highway Lounge. As I said, that was the place where Jimmy Knapp and his crew did their daily business. I remember when people would come to see Jimmy. Well, he would never really talk business inside because of the saying, the walls have ears. So he would go outside with whom, whoever he had to speak with and walk up and down from one corner to the next, back and forth, until business was discussed. And then he would come back inside. And if he had to discuss business with someone else... He would repeat the same routine over and over again. Just take a walk from one corner to the next until they finished their discussion. And then they would come back inside. And my mother Rose was the one behind the bar. And she would have their drinks ready for them. During the day, the Highway Lounge functioned as a business meeting place when Jimmy was there. Then in the evening, Jimmy would leave there and stop at Creasy's, a neighborhood restaurant, before heading home. In the evening, it was usually one of Jimmy's sons, Lefty or Tony or Rocco, or all three, who would be there, and then it would more or less become party time. It was the place to hang out, and not so much for business, but to have a good time. My mother wasn't usually there then. She was mostly there when Jimmy was there. But there were times when I was there in the evening, and well, I have some fond memories. In 1986, the FBI came down hard on Jimmy and his crew. The Federal Bureau of Investigation, or as we call them, forever bothering Italians. They attempted to seize all of Jimmy's assets, but before they could, Jimmy sold the highway lounge and the place where I spent most of my growing up years, 85 Heathermeyer Street. He sold them both for a song. As the saying goes, he had no choice. They were really coming down hard on Jimmy and his crew. I guess the walls had ears after all. In 1988, Jimmy Knapp was indicted for conspiracy to murder. The murder victim was to be another capo of another crime family, and he was named John Gotti. Yes, the John Gotti, who was much more high profile than Jimmy was. Jimmy's style was to be as low profile as possible. Anyway, the FBI wanted Gotti for themselves. In 1992, James Jimmy Knapp Napoli passed away. It was truly the end of an era. A few years later, in 1997, Mama Rose passed away. I'll never forget that day. December 7th, a date for me that will live in infamy, like Pearl Harbor. As far as I'm concerned, that year we lost three great women, three great ladies. Princess Diana, Mother Teresa, and Mother Rose. She was primarily... She was preparing the tomato sauce, or as we called it, gravy, for our traditional Sunday dinner. My brother Michael and I were there as usual. All of a sudden, she had a breathing attack and couldn't breathe. Michael told her to lie down. 
I escorted her into the bedroom and placed her on the bed. I knew I was never going to see her alive again. I told her how much I loved her. I hope she heard me. I told her how much I loved her and kissed her. And then she was gone. Mama Rose was gone. Her funeral, her funeral looked like a scene out of The Godfather. They were all there to pay their respects. At one point, Jimmy's son Tony appeared, but he would not go near the coffin. He said he would rather remember my mother the way she was, full of life. At another point during the funeral, Jimmy's son Lefty approached my brother and me and asked what we planned on doing for her burial. When we informed him that we were going to have her cremated due to lack of funds, Lefty then walked over to some of the guys there and then came back and informed my brother and me that she was to be buried in a plot at Calvary Cemetery where most of her family was also buried and it was to be a family plot with room for my brother Michael and myself when our time came. We couldn't thank him enough. So that was my story of my mother Rose and some of her friends. I only saw them at their best. I only saw their good side. They were friends and they were family. And that's how I'll always remember them. What do you give to the woman who has given all her life and love to you? What do you give to the reason you are living? I could window shop the world before I'm through and nothing would be good enough for you, Mama, a rainbow. Mama, a rainbow. Mama, the sunshine. Mama, the moon to wear. That's not good enough. No, not good enough. Not for Mama, Mama, a palace, diamonds like doorknobs, mountains of gold to spare. That's not rich enough, no, not rich enough, not for Mama, Mama, lifetime. Crowded with laughter, that's not long enough. No, not long enough. What can I give you that I can give you? What will your present be? Mama young and beautiful, always young. And beautiful, that's the mama I'll always see. That's the mama with love from me. That's the mama with love from me I miss you mama
Hey, who's this fucking guy? You know this fucking guy? Who's this fucking guy? Well, you know this fucking guy? Who's that fucking guy? Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the uh, documentary, my documentary film, Williamsburg, Brooklyn, then and now, my mother and her friends. And I thank you all for watching. And uh, I'm still here in the neighborhood in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. It is now uh, 2024. And Williamsburg, Brooklyn is looking better than ever. And hopefully you all agree with me that my documentary film is better than ever. Anyway, thank you all for watching.